Okay, so this lecture is to give you a little background on ancient Greece, give you some context for the Iliad, and also for the Greek poetry we'll be looking at in, in a week or two. All right, and, and, so, and it is also in ancient Greece that we find what will come to be considered the beginnings of Western literature. So this is where all the literature that you probably were taught in high school uh, gets its beginnings. So now in the early years of Greece, as far as their language, we're not sure what the origins are, uh, but we realize the origins must belong to what's known as the Indo-European family of languages. So you should know that term. Uh, Indo-European is a term that came about when similarities were noted between the languages of India, Iran, and Europe, uh, languages such as the Celtic language in Europe. And it is this Indo-European language and the religion of the Greeks of uh, believing in multiple gods and gods that are unlike the Judeo-Christian God uh, that identifies and characterizes the ancient Greeks, uh, makes them unique. Now, the gods of Greece interfere and or intervene in the lives of the Greeks. These gods are fallible and had human-like flaws, such as jealousy and love. So these gods reflect more human characteristics than the theistic god of the Hebrew Bible, which you will read portions of. Now, the Greeks will become a colonizing people due to necessity. Uh, the Greek peninsula is one that is not hospitable to many crops or farming methods uh, because it's hilly and mountainous. And so the Greeks, instead of looking inward for more land, look out and beyond the Mediterranean Sea for colonies to provide their fertile land. And so that is why they start expanding. And there's a map of Greece circa 425 before the Common Era. Give you some idea uh, of what it looked like. Now... Greece, in the early years, developed what's called political and geographical entities called city-states. Now, do not confuse these with cities today. They're not like that at all. Uh, they're almost like separate countries within the country of Greece. Each of these city-states has its own government. Many have uh, their own military, their own navy. But they do share cultural characteristics, such as speaking the same language, though there will be different dialects, and worshiping the same gods. But at this time, if you ask someone where he or she is from, the answer will not be Greece. Uh, the answer will be Athens or Sparta or some other city-state. And in fact, uh, the loyalties of these city-states are such that many times the city-states go to war against one another and for long periods of time. Uh, and so you can see that they're more like separate countries than they are just cities within the same country. Now, the two major city-states were Athens and Sparta, and in many respects, these two are polar opposites in that Athens was a cultural oasis and Sparta was a military mecca. And so each of them emphasizes a different aspect of the human nature. Uh, Athens will develop what we consider to be the first democracy, though very much like the early democracy of this country, only certain people are allowed to participate, and mostly that's well-to-do men. Uh, women are excluded entirely, and of course, so are the slaves, uh, and there are many slaves in Athens at this time. Prior to the city-states had kings prior to this democracy, and these kings will all but disappear by the time of Homer, however, except in the city-state of Sparta. Now, one of the positive outcomes of this limited democracy in Athens is, we, as we see in all societies, a need to educate those who will hold power and run the various institutions. And so education comes about. Now, the Iliad and the Odyssey are used in education by having the children memorize and then write out these parts of the poems they've memorized. These stories also incorporate many of the values of the Greek people. Uh, so this is true of the Torah in Palestine, and we will see it in India with the Ramayana. Uh, by discussing such things as the feats of uh, the feats of the heroes, uh, these values are, are are honored. Now, be aware, however, that Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey, unlike the Hollywood World War II movies of the 1950s in this country, does not simply glorify battle. Homer gives us harsh detail of people's deaths, and he shows how everybody, women and children, not just the warriors, suffered due due to the war. Uh, so it's not, 
you know, uh, yay, yay for us type of thing with, with Homer's Iliad. Now, from this education, we also get the sophists, these professional teachers. And these teachers are brought in because they're to teach various skills such as public speaking and topics such as ethics, which are needed for the people who are going to run uh, the city-state of Athens. Now, the most famous of the sophists is Socrates, and of course his pupil Plato, and then Plato's pupil Aristotle uh, will be very famous. And all three of these men uh, hold great influence over Western education, even today. Uh, Aristotle's poetics is still being uh, used by uh, in, uh, people teaching writing. Uh, and it's from Socrates that we get the Socratic method of teaching, where the teacher asks a question to be answered by the student, and then there's a build-up on that with a back-and-forth conversation to the grasp of the concept is achieved. Of course, with education, there came a attack on the status quo. It's what happens when people become educated. Uh, and this is especially true on the myths and the concepts of the gods at the time. And because of this and a few other, a lot of other things that happened uh, because of a war, uh, Socrates is seen as uh, attacking the gods and for corrupting the young with his ideas. And so eventually he's put to death. All right, so back to the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, a little more specific about them. Uh, the Iliad is believed to be written in the 8th century before the Common Era and covers what we think is the Trojan War, since Ilias is another name for Troy. And this took place during the 12th century BCE, though how much is historical with the Iliad is, is definitely under question. Uh, the war is between the Achaeans, or the Greeks, and the Trojans. And we believe that the actual writings are based on 400 years of oral tradition. So, and these combine many disparate sources. So it's not just the one story. It's an awful lot of stories were brought together by Homer uh, and into the Iliad. Now, there's also a question as to whether Homer wrote both the Iliad and the Odyssey. And this has been a, a major debate since the 18th century. Now, many scholars do believe, however, that Homer, or at least one author, wrote each of the works. And the reason for this is due to poetic devices that run throughout the work such as Homeric similes. These are similes one thing is compared to another, such as the warriors being compared to lions attacking boars. There are many of these extended similes in Book 22, The Death of Hector in the Iliad, and I ask you to keep your eye out for those and, and be aware of them. Also, the work is written mostly in hexameter, uh, which is a poetic device that breaks the line, each line of the poem, into six sections, and each section contains a long syllable followed by two short syllables. Uh, much of it is written that way. So this consistency with the meter, the Homeric similes, is why scholars believe that each work was written by one author. The other thing you should know about the Odyssey and the Iliad is that fundamental values are inherent to the works. This is uh, such as the value of glory received in battle, honor, uh, and the acceptance of fate. Uh, so those are various values that, that we see throughout the works. Now, along with the Bible, the Iliad and the Odyssey are seen today as the beginning of Western literature, and Western literature will come out of, of these works. All right, so there's a short background on this. hope it gives you a little bit of context for reading the Iliad.